Um, okay, so we are. We are wrapping up our series, Masterpiece, and today's topic is uh, a bit heavy. So I'm just going to go right into it with you. You've been warned, heavy topic, serious stuff. Um, do you think that anybody here, you specifically, do you think that you could deny the existence of evil in the world? You don't have to raise your hand. You can nod your head. Would, would you, you know, deny it? And, and nobody's shaking their head yes. If you're watching online, I don't think that you could deny the presence of evil. Um, I know I certainly couldn't. I was actually in Las Vegas on October 1st of 2017. Uh, if that date sounds familiar to you, it should. Uh, that is the largest and deadliest mass shooting in United States history. And I was in Las Vegas the day that that had happened. Um, if you're a little bit unfamiliar with it in just 10 minutes, a single shooter uh, shot over 500 people, injuring over 400 and killing nearly 60 in 10 minutes was all it took. Uh, there were a bunch of people just attending a concert festival right there on the Las Vegas Strip. Now, I was there teaching about prayer because I have a, my best friend lives in Las Vegas. He started a church in Las Vegas, and I had spoken earlier that day about prayer. Now, I wake up the next morning, and my phone is just blowing up because we're in the Midwest. All my family and friends are in the Midwest, but you're in Las Vegas, so that's a different time zone, a couple hours ahead here. And so my phone was just blowing up, and it was probably 4.30 a.m. that time, but 6.30 here, so reasonable time for everyone to be awake here. And they were asking if I was okay. You know, are you okay? Where are you? Did you hear what happened? And, and I had no idea what anyone was talking about. So I jump on my phone, and I just look up, just type in Las Vegas in Google, because I know that they'd bring up the top news, and I just see that the early reports is that there have been uh, 100 people had been shot, and then uh, 150, and then the number keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And then what the local news was saying was that, hey, we're running out of blood. Um, the hospital in which they were bringing all of the victims and survivors was actually only about two and a half blocks away from the house that I was staying at with my friend. So we drove over to the hospital right where everyone was at, and we were giving blood because uh, in a mass shooting, blood is what you need because people are bleeding to death. And so they, with, and with 500 people shot, you need a lot of blood. And so we went over there, and they're trying to get people through as quickly as possible to get blood. And literally going from the place where they're taking the blood, which was the parking lot of the hospitals where they set up all the tents and everything and just walking it right over the hospital. I mean, literally just taking the coolers, just going right away because they needed the blood um, that badly. And uh, I mentioned that because to me, that just really stands out as the embodiment of evil. That one person, and, and you look this up on Wikipedia because you know, you're trying to just learn about this event. One of the things that they keep saying is there was no known motive. One, I don't know if having a motive would make it any better for anybody to be like, oh, okay, well, that's why he did it. I understand. But no known motive, he was evil for the sake of being evil. He did this to kill as many people as he could in the shortest period of time because he was evil. I don't think any of you would deny the presence of evil. I know I certainly could not. These people in Las Vegas, they weren't just people on the news to me. I knew people. I had spoken to people earlier that day at a church like this who lost loved ones or had loved ones who were shot. Your life is forever changed in a moment because of a single great act of evil. Um, I don't think that it's just an American problem. Sometimes that's what we, we're told is that this is a uniquely American problem. I don't think so. Um, there's no denying the evil that exists globally and historically. You think of the Holocaust uh, when over six million people were killed simply because they were Jews. So, but it's not just a long time ago. It's not like, oh, well, that was back in the primitive ages. You think of the Syrian civil war that's going on right now in which humanitarian aid, medicine, food, and water is being withheld. Good people are trying to send help, and that help is getting blocked at the border, not allowed to come into the country. Uh, we know that their government has used chemical weapons against its own civilians. We know that um, children are being tortured. That's kind of one of the, the things that isn't really talked about, but when you start to read about the Syrian civil war, they're using children as torture. They, they use rape as a weapon of war. 
And it should make us feel heavy. I mean, this isn't a feel-good message right now. And you might be wondering, like, okay, um, why are we talking about this in church? Like, we know the world is bad, Steve. And every time we open up a computer or a tablet or our phone, we, we, we're bombarded with bad news. And, and I think that that's why we specifically need to talk about it. There's so much bad stuff going on in the world. There's so much evil going on in the world that a person of faith has to wrestle with that. A person of faith can't just bury their head into the ground and say, well, I'm just going to pretend like I'm just going to be optimistic because God loves me and that's checked. That's good enough. I can tell you I'm a pastor, but in that day in Las Vegas, there was no amount of optimism that could make me spin this scenario into a good one. There was nothing that I could say that was like, oh, wow, well, this is, this is awesome because, because it wasn't. It wasn't awesome at all. It totally and completely sucked. There are no adequate words or no appropriate words, no words that I could use in this space to describe just how empty I feel. And it's not just out there. It's not just around the world. Here in Wisconsin, almost a year ago to this date, about a year ago, two weeks ago, a 20-year-old 20 20-year-old 20 man broke into a 13-year-old Jamie Kloss's house, shot and killed both her parents, kidnapped her. Uh, you guys might remember the story. It was all over the news about a year ago. And uh, my family prayed for Jamie. I mean, I, 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 we posted about it on Instagram. My family, we prayed for Jamie. We have kids, and I'm not saying that if you don't have kids, you don't relate to Jamie being kidnapped. Absolutely. Anybody who's been victimized in some way, shape, or form knows what, that, knows what that's like to a point. But we prayed for Jamie, and it was about three months later in January that Jamie escaped. And what we found out was that this guy kidnapped her and locked her in his bedroom, specifically underneath his bed. Um, when he went out, she finally was able to escape. And talking about evil, they ask him, why, why Jamie? Like, did you stalk her on social media? Like, did, did you know her family? Did they make you mad? Was this revenge? Like, what was it? And his response, his actual response, I was on my way home from work one day. I saw her get off the bus, and I knew she was the one I wanted to take. That's nearly a direct quote. Why did you take Jamie? Just felt like it. Why did you kill her parents in front of her? I just felt like it here in Wisconsin. It's only two hours north of where we live here. Jamie's home. That story ended better than it could have. But the weight of evil and just talking about these things that happened last year or is happening somewhere around the world or it happened a few years ago, the weight is heavy. and It shouldn't make us feel good. I don't know. I don't think it, it is possible for anybody, regardless of what you believe, Christian or not, I don't think anybody would deny that evil exists in the world, that there is an evil problem outside of the world. So why today? Well, I kind of gave you my first answer. The first one is, I think that as people of faith, we have to address it. We have to address it because it is real. It is out there. God doesn't say just be blindly optimistic, okay? If you didn't know that, I'm telling you right now, nowhere in the Bible does it say, if you're a believer, you just need to be blindly optimistic and look for the good in every situation. That's not it, okay? So I think we have to know how to respond. But the second thing is, as we're finishing up our series Masterpiece, this is how Paul finishes the letter. We've been in the series for five weeks now, going through the entire book of the Ephesians. If you want to turn to the Ephesians with me, by all means do it. We're going to be in chapter 6 today. But Paul has been addressing issues of identity. Who are you? Who am I? Who are we? And Paul ends this letter. And hasn't it been kind of a fun series? I think it's been a fun series. Week one, I am God's masterpiece. And it was like, awesome. We're awesome. You're awesome. We're all awesome. And week two, we talked about how we're all part of God's family and the family needs to be diverse. And, and I felt really good about that. And then in week three, Dan talked about how we're all work in progress, which is encouraging because just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're done. You don't get baptized and come out of the pool a perfect person. I hate to burst your bubble. You're a work in progress. Therefore, we need to be gracious with ourselves 
and gracious toward other people. And so Dan's message was encouraging. So I was like, I'm, I'm God's masterpiece. I'm a member of a diverse family. I'm a work in progress. Last week, we did the best thing ever. The best news, you are gifted. You have something to contribute. You are awesome. God wired you a certain way to give back to the world. You are not just somebody who needs to consume constantly. You have something to give. And that's how Paul's whole letter to the Ephesians has gone. And then we get to this point where Paul's like, now, before, you know, when you're trying to get off the phone with someone, and they're like, one, one more thing. And that's what Paul's doing. He's wrapping up his letter, and he's saying, mm, one more thing about your identity that you got to know. And he's talking about spiritual warfare. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that, you know, yeah, nobody would deny the presence of evil. But I would say, especially if you grew up in the Western Hemisphere— of the world, I would say it's very likely that you believe in evil, but you don't believe in the devil or in demons. Seems a little weird, right? We believe in evil, but not devil, devils and demons. Um, but I want to confront that a little bit. I want to challenge you, if I can. If, if you're who I'm speaking about right now, you believe in evil, but not, not Satan and not demons, I would just ask that you go on a journey with me over the next 20 minutes here and see if I can help change your mind. Okay. Uh, any of you guys familiar with C.S. Lewis? When I say C.S. Lewis, you know who I'm talking about? I, I, I'm sure you all do. He wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay. So that's C.S. Lewis, part of the Chronicles of Narnia series, which you may not know, those of you who did know who C.S. Lewis was, was that he was a pretty staunch atheist for a lot of his life. Uh, he was not born into a family that raised him in the church and that he was just this good church boy and grew up and loved God. He wasn't. Far from it. Actually, and, and you really, you can't make this up. He didn't become a Christian until he met his friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings. See this weird, crazy world. They actually met in college before either of them had written really anything worth noting. And J.R.R. Tolkien worked with C.S. Lewis, and they, they battled each other and debated, and finally Lewis was, couldn't deny God anymore. So Lewis becomes a Christian, and he writes The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And, but what you may not know is just outside of his fictional works is that C.S. Lewis writes some really good theology. He writes some really good theological works. And one of those things that he does is called the screw tape letters. And it's even better than it sounds, okay? I mean, and the screw tape letters already sounds pretty freaking fantastic, doesn't it? But it is all, it is better than it sounds. And in the screw tape letters, uh, C.S. Lewis, he tries to illustrate the Christian view of demons. So he's writing this book, and he's saying, this is kind of how Christians and, and demons interact with each other. Now, who is Screwtape? Screwtape is this senior-level demon, if you will. And he's writing to his nephew, uh, Woodworm, Wormwood, excuse me, Wormwood, who is a junior devil. And Screwtape instructs Wormwood on how to cause the human in which he has been assigned— a man who is only referred to ever as the patient, uh, how to commit sins and how to condemn him to hell. And so you read this book and it's just letters sent between demons on how to get people to, to screw up. And the reason I bring that up is because there's a, there's a line in here. It's a paragraph. I'm going to read it. But I think it speaks directly to all of us here today. And this is how Screwtape replies when the young Wormwood asks if it's important for him to remain hidden. So I wonder if you should ask me whether it is essential to keep the patient in ignorance of our own existence. Our policy, for the moment, is to conceal ourselves. I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in modern imagination will help you. If any faith suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he can't believe in that, he therefore can't believe in you. Lewis, over 50 years ago, in this book, this fictional writing, declares, now you know how Satan is probably attacking us? by keeping us unaware of him, by remaining hidden. He says, our policy, can you imagine hell having a policy like an HR department? Our policy right now is to remain hidden. 
And I think that that's what happens in our society. I think Satan and demons and the whole darkness of the spiritual world hides behind possessed dolls made by Hollywood movies. And I think that since we see those and we say, Annabelle can't be real, Chucky can't be real, that's stupid, we throw everything out. And while I would agree with you, I don't believe in possessed dolls. I think it's a mistake to throw it all out. And I think that the writers of the New Testament and a lot of the Bible would agree with me. John says that the devil has been sinning against God from the very beginning and that he is the influencer behind sin. So John acknowledges that Matthew describes the devil as an agent behind temptation. In Luke's gospel, this one's interesting, there's a woman who has been crippled for 18 years, and Luke says that she was bound by Satan. This is an important distinction to make here, okay? Because not every time you get sick did the devil do it, okay? Sometimes you just get the flu because it's flu season and you live in the world, okay? And Luke acknowledges that. Luke sometimes just says sickness is just sickness and that sometimes people just need to be healed, other times, like with this case, Luke says the reason she's sick is because she is bound by Satan. So it's an acknowledgement that sometimes things that look natural in the world are actually spiritual. Okay, you guys following? And uh, Paul in other letters says that Satan deceives by masquerading himself as an angel of light. Satan pretends to be good. He entices. He tries to make it look like it's okay, and, but his intentions are evil manipulative. And if Paul, Matthew, Luke, John isn't enough evidence for you, Jesus himself certainly seems to believe in devil and the devil and in demons. He describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies in chapter 8 verse 44 of John. So with so many biblical references to Satan and the devil, why is it that you and I forget that we are undergoing a spiritual battle. How is it that we don't think about this every moment of every day or something? Um, one more thing. I know I'm really laying it on thick this morning, but I'm trying to convince all of you that not only does evil exist, but so does Satan and demons, okay? When I was working on a master's degree, my program, my classmates, mostly made up of people not from the United States incredible experience, awesome experience to have so many different perspectives from all over the world speaking into theology issues. And of course we debate, because that's what you do when you're studying a master's degree. You argue with your classmates about things that nobody else even thinks about. But one of the things that everybody not from here agreed on and disagreed with us was the realness of spiritual warfare. To them, to people from other countries, not the United States, not Europe, spiritual warfare was as real as the chair you're sitting in, as the building we're meeting in. And they could not believe, they said, you know, you're just so comfortable in the United States that Satan's best strategy against you is to just stay hidden because you don't believe in him. So he can whisper in your ear all of these things and you don't believe in him and you do those things. And it's that way that messes your life up. Now, I don't think that, here's the thing. Can I state the obvious? I don't think people not from the United States are ignorant. Okay, so don't even go there. Don't say, well, you know, they're from Africa or they're from India or they're from, you know, somewhere else. And we're the United States and we're just so much more intellectual and further down the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just shut up. No, they're not dumb. I've talked with all of them. There's some really brilliant people who absolutely believe in Satan who absolutely believe in demons. And so if I can get real just offensive with you and throw a punch, I would say the ignorant people in the room were from this country. It was me. It was people like me. It was just more convenient not to believe in spiritual warfare. Um, but we do have battles every day. And I think that we need to develop a discernment on those battles. No, I don't think that every time you stub your toe, Satan pushed you into the you know, couch corner. I don't believe that, but I think that there are some areas in our lives in which spiritual warfare is happening. I think that we have battles with other people. 
I think relational battles are spiritual warfare. It may be that coworker who is out to get you, that neighbor who is driving you crazy. It's all of those people that we're supposed to love, reach out to, who are driving us nuts. Perhaps that's the spiritual warfare going on in your life. Um, sometimes I think it's just a battle with plain, old school, the temptation of sin. We try to justify our bad behavior and our bad thoughts. Well, you know, it's not that bad. Well, I'm not hurting anybody. Well, you know, if you just kind of look at that verse a different way or blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the spiritual battle you're having is just plain old sin. It's just yourself. Stop justifying it. Some of us are battling circumstances that seem to want to take you out. Could be a financial spiritual battle. It could be a physical spiritual battle. How about this one? Your mental health might be a spiritual battle. I'm not at all dismissing the realness of mental health issues at all. But have you ever thought that maybe it's made worse by spiritual darkness? Potentially. I want you to just take a moment right now and think about what you're facing on a daily basis. What was the battle the past seven days? I mean, what, what really challenged you? What really made you mad this week? And as you think about that, I want you to use the discernment right now. Is there an element of spiritual warfare that's going on right there? Paul ends this way because he knows the answer is yes. He knows the answer is yes. Even if it's a little yes, it's a yes. And Paul, at the end of his letter, he addresses a few different ways that we handle spiritual warfare the wrong way. And that's what I want to share with you is how you thought of that battle the last seven days, the last month, the last year. I don't know how long it's been, but there's three mistakes that I think you could potentially make. You could be making one of them, two of them. Shoot, if you're like me, you're making all three of them on the regular basis. But one of the things that we make the mistake of is that we try to fight our spiritual battles on our own power. We try to fight our spiritual battles on our own power. And if, in chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm facing some kind of battle, my first inclination is not to pray about it. It is not to lean on God, but rather it is to look inward and to take care of the issue myself. Relationship problem, I can fix this. Problem at work, I can fix this. Bad habit, I can stop this. I can turn my life around. Some of you have said that. Some of you do that. Some of you can really relate to me on this one. And that is the first mistake we make is that we don't recognize that uh, sometimes we don't have the strength to do these things on our own. Sometimes we don't, and that's okay. You have an external power. Paul says, be strong in God, who is stronger than you can imagine. You can't even fathom how strong God is. So when we walk up into those situations, whatever they may be, relational or mental health, whatever it is, is our first response to lean on God, to lean into his strength, to ask him for his strength. Because it should be. Because it absolutely should be. No matter what you're facing, no matter how overwhelming life can seem, we don't face challenges alone. And the people sitting around you are awesome. And we talk about community all the time. But there are some things that the person sitting next to you can't help you with. Okay? There are some things that I can't help you with. There are some things that only God can help you with. Why don't we turn to him and start surrendering those things to him? That's the correction for the first mistake. The second mistake is that we fight the wrong enemy. We do this. I think we do this all the time in the United States, especially with the rise of social media, Facebook and Instagram and everything else. Man, isn't it just so easy to just call someone out. They actually did a study. They find out that you are more rude online than you are in person, okay? Not that you needed a study, but it's out there, okay? So the science shows you're more rude. You know why? It's because they can't punch you in the face. Have you guys seen that floating around? That's why people are so mean. It's because they can't punch you anymore. Back in the day, you had to be accountable for your words or you might get hit. Oftentimes, okay, not only do we lean on our own power, but the second thing we do is that we're fighting the wrong enemy. Paul continues in verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. This is the important part right here. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When you are in the middle of a battle, your enemy is not the rude barista. She's just a rude barista. Move on. She is not your spiritual enemy. It is not your unreasonable and demanding boss. Move on. It's not them. It is not a family member or a friend who has disappointed you. Again, they are not your enemy. Paul makes it very clear that we are to either reach people who are far from God or to reconcile with people who are near God who we're having conflict with. But in no scenario is the person that we're looking at our enemy. He says, don't forget your enemy is in the unseen realm. We fail to see the bigger reality and instead we just focus on people, our brothers and sisters, and we fight the wrong enemies. And that's why we go through the same problems over and over and over again. It's because we try to do it ourselves and then we're fighting against the wrong opponent. People are not your enemies. The third mistake, the final mistake I think that Paul brings up is that we fight with the wrong tactics. How do you respond in life when somebody wrongs you? I'm sure you are all more spiritual and better off and more mature than I am. But let me tell you that when somebody wrongs me, I want to wrong them back. I know none of you can relate to that. That's okay. I'm just confessing to you. I want to wrong them back. When somebody hurts me or hurts my family or acts out against us, I want to return the favor. Whatever they did, I want to go lower, okay? But as we continue to read through the Ephesians passage, we look at this armor of God that Paul tells us to put on. And he says there's the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of readiness, shield of faith, helmet of salvation. And in verse 13, Paul says, put on the full armor of God. Why? So that when the day of evil comes, you may stand your ground. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Okay? Paul just described a bunch of armor, and he says the purpose of the armor is to stand firm. And a lot of times when we think spiritual warfare, we think let's load up the super soakers with some ice water and charge hell. But that's not the charge that Paul gives us. That's not the charge he gave them. He says, you have all of this armor and it's defensive. And he says, it's so that you will stand firm. That you will be able to stand your ground. We use the wrong tactics. I think we try to charge. We get too offensive. We get too aggressive. And we try to take out our spiritual enemies when God says, stand firm. And I know that this can be hard. And what I've seen in 2019, and I'm gone back and forth on whether or not I'm going to share this, but I will. But I think that in 2019, one of the things that we do so wrong as, as people of faith is that we run. We move on. I'm not feeling God anymore. Well, I'm not growing here anymore. Well, the pastor's not feeding me anymore. Well, you know, I used to just be really excited about it, and now I'm not anymore. And the devil's saying, well, let's just go. Try somewhere else. Do something else. Take a couple weeks off. And I'm not saying that everyone who doesn't go to church here was led by Satan, so don't think that. But I think the church in large, the, the big C church, believers, the body of Christ, I don't think we stand firm at all. I think that that is a major problem that we have. And maybe that's the prophetic gifting coming out, and maybe it's just me being immature. But I don't think that we stand firm at all. I think when the wind blows left, we go left. And I think when the wind blows right, we go right. And we like to find the easiest path to the goals that we have. We never stop to ask God, what do you want from me? God, do you want me here? God isn't just God of the mountains. He's the God of the valleys. And sometimes people have followed God in some pretty bad places because God had a better thing for them out on the other side. I think that we lack a trust in God, which is why we don't stand firm. I, I think that we don't trust that God. We say, well, we got faith, but then our actions betray us. And if we don't have trust, trust is faith, the verb. Are we going to trust God? Are we going to have so much faith in God that we're going to stand firm? Instead of praying, God, get me through this, whatever this is, why don't we start praying, God, what are you trying to show me through this? God, what are you trying to do in me, around me? 
instead of praying, let me get through this quicker, say, God, help me understand the lesson quicker. And I'm not saying that God is behind every bad thing because he's not. We read all throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament that the devil, Satan, is behind these bad things and these temptations. But God works those things for our good. And so instead of just going with the easiest path or, well, you know, this person said this. Well, you know, I talked to my mom and she said this. Well, you know, I had a youth pastor 20 years ago and he said this. Instead of doing any of that, why don't we stop and lean on God's strength and say, I'm going to stand firm. Because that's how God told me to take care of my spiritual warfare. It wasn't to blame someone else. And it's not to run. It's to look my enemy in the eye. James says, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. He doesn't say, if you charge the devil, if you pray a certain prayer, if you bring water that's been blessed by someone, the devil runs from you. He says, no, if you resist, if you stand firm, if you don't move, the devil will move on. Counter that with, he says, if you draw close to God, God draws close to you. We want to stand firm against the devil, but we want to walk toward God. Paul writes in Romans 12, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, he's not talking about the people around you. He says, you believers live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but have room for God's wrath. For it is written, this is Paul quoting Proverbs. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our natural fighting tactic is to go on the offense, but we are told to not take revenge. We're told to trust that God is the ultimate judge and authority of this world. He will take care of things. He will take care of you. His heart breaks with you, whatever it is you're going through. But he's saying, you do not personally seek out revenge. Stand firm. Lean on God's strength. Back in Ephesians 6, Paul continues his praying the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be on alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. If you want an offensive weapon, it's prayer. Pray for your strength. Pray for your endurance. Pray that you're able to stand firm. And Paul says, pray for the person sitting behind you, next to you, in front of you. Pray for the other believers in the world that they might do the same. Let's let God handle all of the stuff that we're going through. Let him sort it all out and, and, and to seek justice. And I get it, that can be hard to do with, with all of the news and battles raging in and around us and all of that, but how can we stand firm? Well, we can stand firm in the peace and confidence knowing that our God is for us, that nothing can stand against us. It's written. We don't need to fight back mostly because the battle's already been won. Jesus lives life we should have lived, died death we deserved, overcame death. And in John 10.10, 10, he says, the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life to the full. And his victory on the cross on that day means that you already have victory. I don't know what it, you're going through. Every single person, your relationship dynamics, your financial situation, mental health. I don't know all of those things. I know some of those things. But what I do know is that Jesus already won the battle for us. There will come a time when your time on earth is over and that you're going to enter into heaven. You're going to be with God and those things that are bothering you now won't. Now, I'm not saying that this is just a wing and a prayer and just run out the clock situation until you get to heaven. I, I believe that God will make things better here on earth for us as we allow him to. But it is never to get distracted and say that my earthly situations are going to determine my eternal consequence. Don't walk away from God because of a challenge that you're having. Let the difficult times bring you closer to God. Let the things that you're battling toward draw you closer to God, help you trust in God more and have more faith in God. What does that mean for our identity? That's what we're talking about, right? Who am I? You are strong. That's the final part of the series. You're a member of God's family. You're God's masterpiece. You're a work in progress, but you're gifted. And you are strong. And you're not strong because of anything you've done. You're not strong because of the things you've overcome or the things you haven't overcome, but you're not weak 
You're not weak because of the things you haven't overcome. You are strong because of the God who lives in you now. If you are a believer here, if you have faith, you are strong because God is strong. You are strong because God is in you, with you, around you, through you. God is already in tomorrow. You're not, but God already is. So let's go forward. And as we remember part of the masterpiece that we are, it is that we are strong.